The next chapter in your text is vascular pathology, and the first section that we're going to talk about is vasculitis. Uh, vasculitis is defined as inflammation of the blood vessel wall. You can have inflammation of the arterial wall. We can also have inflammation of the uh, wall of veins. However, in this particular section, we're going to focus on inflammation of the arterial wall. Now remember that when you think about a blood vessel, the wall of the blood vessel is composed of three layers. There's an intima, a media, and an adventitia. And so I've included this normal artery in your um, textbook in order to remind you of these three layers. So this innermost layer here, which is dark blue, that represents the intima. And remember that the intima is composed of endothelial cells sitting on a basement membrane. Underneath the intima is the media, and that's composed of smooth muscle. And outside of the media is the adventitia, and that is the connective tissue layer of the blood vessel. That's the third layer of the blood vessel. And so we have an intima, a media, and an adventitia. Now when patients develop a vasculitis, the etiology is usually not known. It is important to note that most cases are not infectious. Clinically, we can have uh, two types of symptoms when patients get vasculitis. The first are nonspecific symptoms. And the idea here is that the patient's got inflammation. And so if they have inflammation, they're going to have fever, fatigue, weight loss, myalgias, etc. And those are relatively nonspecific, and they're seen in most of the vasculitides. Also present will be symptoms of organ ischemia. Now, first, we should remind ourselves that when we have a vasculitis, it preferentially will involve certain organs. So each of these diseases has a different vascular bed that it likes to affect. And the symptoms will be predominantly that of organ ischemia. And the idea is that if you've got a blood vessel and you disrupt the blood vessel with vasculitis, one of the things that happens is that the endothelial cells get damaged. And if the endothelial cells get damaged, that would expose the subendothelial collagen and the tissue factor sitting underneath the endothelial cell, which would then activate the coagulation cascade, which would then result in formation of a thrombus. And so one way by which you can get organ ischemia is thrombosis. And the second way by which organ ischemia can arise is that if this is a blood vessel and you inflame the wall, then after inflammation, healing always ensues. And so with the healing, we would get fibrosis. And fibrosis of the blood vessel wall would narrow the lumen, decreasing the blood flow to a particular organ, again, resulting in symptoms of organ ischemia. When you think about vasculitis, the best way to divide it is large vessel, medium vessel, and small vessel. The large vessel vasculitides, they involve the aorta or its major branches, and there are two that we're going to discuss. The first is called temporal or giant cell arteritis. Now, I put the entire uh, name together, temporal giant cell arteritis, because I think that once you know the name, that everything is downhill, the name gives away much of what you need to know about this disorder. Before we begin, however, it's the most common form of vasculitis in older adults, classically seen in a patient greater than the age of 50, and it usually affects females. Now, the classic location of this vasculitis is branches of the carotid artery. Now, these are the large branches of the carotid artery, for example, the temporal artery, which would lead to headache, the ophthalmic artery, which would lead to visual disturbances. We can, have, we, we can also have involvement of um, the arteries that feed the jaw, in particular the muscles of the jaw, giving us jaw claudication. So these are some of the classic uh, findings in a patient with temporal giant cell arteritis. And of course, the most classic is the temporal artery involvement, and hence the term temporal arteritis. Also present in these patients can be flu-like symptoms with joint and muscle pain, and that's classically called polymyalgia rheumatica, and it's, a, it's present in a subset of patients with temporal giant cell arteritis, and classically the ESR would be elevated. In particular, the ESR is often greater than 100, and that's another characteristic feature of this disorder. Patients who have temporal giant cell arteritis will then often undergo biopsy, and when biopsy is performed, what we will see is an inflamed vessel wall. That's because we're dealing with a vasculitis, often with giant cells, and that's because there is granulomatous inflammation. And also the patients will have intimal fibrosis in their uh, blood vessel, and that's because with all this inflammation is going to ensue a healing response. Important to note again that we're going to have a granulomatous vasculitis with giant cells, but if you remember the name, temporal giant cell arteritis, you're not going to have trouble remembering that.
Now, a couple important things that are derivatives of this uh, discussion. The first is that in this particular disorder, the lesions are segmental, so that if you look at a long segment of a blood vessel, only one area might be involved. And that, therefore, uh, translates to a clinical principle, which is that when you want to do a biopsy, you have to take a very long piece of the vessel. That's the first point. The second point is that you have to examine all of that blood vessel under the microscope. So we would slice up the blood vessel like this and then examine the entire blood vessel under the microscope. And then the third point is that if you get a negative biopsy, that would not exclude disease because you may have only taken a piece of the vessel where disease is not present. So a negative biopsy does not exclude the disease. The patient may still have the disease. Here's what the disorder looks like on biopsy. This is the intima and out here is the smooth muscle media and what we can see is that in between the media and the intima we've got this broad area of fibrosis now remember that normally the intima should be right up against the media however here we've got this area of separation between the intima and the media and that's because we've got all this fibrosis from the inflammation and again what happens is that when you get this fibrosis now we've narrowed this lumen and the, the narrowing of the lumen will decrease the amount of blood that's flowing to, uh, to whatever this blood vessel is feeding. Another important uh, thing that we can notice here, there's inflammation in the blood vessel wall, which is characteristic of this disorder, and of course the presence of giant cells. And now a giant cell basically is characterized by a large cell with multiple nuclei, and you can clearly see that there are multiple nuclei in this one enlarged cell. And so this is what we would expect to see on biopsy. Now the treatment is very high yield, it is corticosteroids, and we need to give treatment as soon as we suspect this disorder because there is a high risk of blindness without treatment. And that's because if we've got the ophthalmic artery and we've got inflammation in the ophthalmic artery, artery we're, we're obviously knocking out the endothelial cells. And again, when you knock out the endothelial cells, you're going to expose the subendothelial collagen and the tissue factor, and so these patients can develop thrombosis of the ophthalmic artery, and if you got thrombosis of the ophthalmic artery, that would cut the blood supply to the eye, resulting in blindness. And of course, that blindness would not be reversible. And so we need to be particularly um, cognizant of this disorder and recognize that we need to treat it immediately. In fact, if we even suspect this disorder, we would go ahead and treat even if we don't have confirmation on a biopsy. So you want to treat them as soon as you think that this disorder might be a possibility. Now another large vessel vasculitis would be tachyasus arteritis. This is basically the same disease as temporal giant cell arteritis. It's, it's, it's a spectrum. That's the way to think about it. So it's, it's the same disease as temporal giant cell arteritis with a couple of exceptions. First of all, just as you see in temporal giant cell arteritis, we're going to have granulomatous vasculitis, so that's easy. However, in temporal giant cell arteritis, we had adults greater than the age of 50. In tachyasus, it's going to be an adult less than the age of 50. And the classic patient is a young Asian female. Now, in gi temporal giant cell arteritis, we involved um, branches of the carotid artery. In tachyasus, we're much more proximal, and instead, we're going to involve the aortic arch at branch points. This is going to result in visual and neurologic symptoms as you cut off the major vessels coming off of the aortic arch. It also can result in weak or absent pulses in an upper extremity. That's, called, that's why it's also called pulseless disease. The ESR will be elevated, and the treatment is corticosteroids. So very similar to temporal giant cell arteritis with a couple exceptions. Exception number one, patients will be less than the age of 50 as opposed to greater than. And exception number two is that it will be at the aortic arch branch points instead of more distal, for example, in the carotid artery. Now, otherwise, these diseases are almost essentially similar. And in fact, sometimes there can be overlap between these two diseases. The next of the disorders are the medium vessel vasculitides, and these involve muscular arteries. And I'd like to highlight that it's the muscular arteries that define a medium vessel. These muscular arteries are the ones that supply organs, and so it'll be these larger, or these medium-sized vessels that supply organs. For example, the renal artery would be one classic example. The first of these disorders is called polyarteritis nodosa, and the name is very helpful. Polyarteritis, multiple arteries, and of course there's going to be inflammation. So this is a necrotizing vasculitis that involves most organs. One important thing to note, however, is that the lung is spared. So when you're thinking about polyarteritis nodosa, you can get signs and symptoms in any organ except the lung. Now this presents in young adults, and 
depending on the different vessel that's involved, you're going to have different signs. For example, if the renal artery is involved, the patient may get hypertension. If the mesenteric artery is involved, the patient will have abdominal symptoms, such as abdominal pain with melena. Of course, if the CNS is involved, we'd have neurologic disturbances, etc. And so these are some of the classic findings in these disorders. It's usually a young adult with hypertension, abdominal pain with melena, neurologic disturbances, and skin lesions. One of the high yield associations to be aware of is that in patients with polyarteritis nodosa, you often find a serum hepatitis B surface antigen um, in those patients. And so that's something to be aware of. Now, interestingly, the lesions of this particular disorder are present in varying stage. So that in some, when you look at the blood vessel, you might find some early lesions. And the early lesions, they consist of transmural inflammation, so that the whole wall is inflamed with a characteristic finding called fibrinoid necrosis. Now, let's go back to chapter one when we talked about the different types of necrosis. And you'll recall that one of the necroses, one of the types of necrosis that we talked about was fibrinoid necrosis. In fibrinoid necrosis, I told you that um, we classically see it in two scenarios. And in one, one of them was vasculitis and the other was uh, malignant hypertension. And so here we're kind of uh, tying together some of the loose ends that we left from chapter one. So this is what I meant when I said that you can often see it in vasculitis. So in this early lesion, it's going to have transmural inflammation characterized by fibrinoid necrosis. Now eventually this early lesion will heal, and when it heals, you'll get massive fibrosis. And this fibrosis will actually lead to a little area that feels bumpy on the blood vessel, and that's why we have the name nodosa. It feels like a node. It feels hard. And so polyarteritis nodosa is a this disorder that involves multiple arteries, multiple medium-sized arteries, and the end stage is healing, resulting in these little nodes or nodules of fibrous tissue. Now, one of the interesting consequences of this varying um, degrees of disease along a single artery is that we often get something called the string of pearls appearance on imaging. So let me briefly explain this. Now basically what happens is you've got this long blood vessel with lesions of varying stage. So for example here might be transmural inflammation with fibrinoid necrosis and that would be an early lesion so let's just label that with E. And then in another area what you're going to get is you're going to get dense fibrosis like this. Now the early lesions, one of the consequences of that inflammation is that we can weaken the wall of the blood vessel and when we weaken the wall of the blood vessel, we might get an aneurysm. So then that is a, by the way, an aneurysm is a dilatation of the blood vessel wall, a balloon-like dilatation of the blood vessel wall. And then here we'd have fibrosis, and here we have another early lesion, which would become an aneurysm. And then here we have fibrosis, and here another early lesion, which would become an aneurysm. So this begins to look like a bunch of pearls on a string. And so they call that the string of pearls appearance, and it's very high yield for examinations. Now here's what it looks like on biopsy and all I want to highlight here is that we've got fibrinoid necrosis. And remember that fibrinoid necrosis histologically has a very pink look to it. I call it the highlighter pink um, color of the vessel wall. And so here you've got this vessel wall and you've got all this pink in the wall and that represents fibrinoid necrosis. The treatment of this disorder would be corticosteroids or uh, cyclophosphamide, and if it's not treated, it's fatal. The next medium vessel vasculitis is Kawasaki's disease, and this classically affects Asian children less than the age of four. Interestingly, these patients present with very nonspecific, vague symptoms. For example, fever, conjunctivitis, a rash of the palms and the soles, and enlarged cervical lymph nodes. Now, if I saw a patient like this, the first thing I would think about would be some sort of viral infection or some sort of infectious process. And that's what I mean when I say that these patients present with very nonspecific symptoms. Now, you want to try to be able to pick up this, um, this disorder because one of the important things to note about Kawasaki's and perhaps the highest yield about Kawasaki's is that the preferential artery that's involved is the coronary artery. Now, when the coronary artery is involved, that can create some major complications. For example, if this is the coronary artery and we've got disruption of the coronary artery by inflammation, if we knock out the endothelial cells, we expose a subendothelial collagen and, sub, and the tissue factor underneath it, which then can result in activation of the coag cascade, 
And if we get a thrombus, that would result in myocardial infarction. So this would be a four-year-old child who could potentially develop a myocardial infarction. Another problem is that if you inflame the blood vessel wall, one of the complications whenever you inflame the wall is that it becomes weak. That can increase the risk for dilatation, which is called an aneurysm. And of course, when you have an aneurysm, you increase the stress on the wall and increase the risk of rupture. So these can eventually rupture, which would be another complication of Kawasaki's disease. The treatment is very interesting, and that is that the patients are given aspirin. Now, why do I say that's so interesting? That's because, remember from discussions in liver pathology, which we'll eventually touch on when we get there, but you never give a patient, um, you never give a child with a viral illness aspirin. And in fact, if you pick up any bottle of aspirin, it'll be written on that bottle not to give a child with viral illness aspirin because of the risk of something called Rye syndrome, where they get encephalopathy and massive liver necrosis. So you, classically speaking, you would never give a child with a quote-unquote viral illness aspirin. However, in this case, you actually want to give the child aspirin even though it looks like they have a viral illness. Now, obviously, they don't have a viral illness, but it looks like it. Now, how does the aspirin help? Well, when you give aspirin, remember that if this is the uh, vessel and you've damaged the endothelium and if you've, you've exposed subendothelial collagen, then what's going to happen is that the platelets are going to adhere to this, um, this area and eventually they're going to aggregate, right? And it's the aggregation that's going to form the framework for the coagulation cascade to come in and produce that thrombus, the final thrombus. Now, aspirin it inhibits platelet cyclooxygenase, and when it inhibits platelet cyclooxygenase, it decreases the ability of those platelets to produce TXA2, and TXA2 is very important for that step of aggregation. And so in this particular case, we give them aspirin, which protects them against the potential formation of a thrombus within the coronary artery. IVIG has also been proven to be helpful uh, in these individuals. The disease is self-limited, so if we can catch the disease and and treat it appropriately, we could um, potentially decrease the risk of this very severe complication. And that's Kawasaki's disease. Now one last thing, and that is that um, sometimes people have trouble remembering that one of the associations with Kawasaki's disease is that they get rash on the palms and rash on the soles. And the way I think about it is uh, I kind of just have in my mind a picture of a four-year-old or some kid uh, sitting on a Kawasaki motorcycle or something. So if they were sitting on a motorcycle, they would be using their palms and their soles to drive the, motor the motorcycle. And then, of course, your heart rate really goes up when you're on a motorcycle. And so you can think about Kawasaki's disease preferentially involving the coronary artery. That's just one silly way of remembering some of the points about this disease. But again, this is a very high yield disease, in particular the treatment uh, and the fact that you would give aspirin to such a patient. Another medium vessel vasculitis is called Berger's disease. This is a necrotizing vasculitis that involves the digits. So you're classically going to see ulceration, gangrene, and autoamputation of the fingers and the toes. What's very important about this disease, and perhaps the highest yield, is that it is basically associated with smoking. It is a smoking disease, essentially. And the treatment would be to stop smoking. Now, of course, the per whatever damage has occurred is going to be permanent, but at least the disorder would no longer uh, progress. One of the interesting findings in these patients is they often have Raynaud phenomena. And Raynaud phenomena, remember, is when the patients get vasospasm that results in discoloration, in this particular case, of the fingers and the toes. What happens is the vasospasm cuts the blood supply to the fingers, for example, which would then cause the fingers to become white. Eventually, they would then become blue as the tissue becomes cyanotic. And then when the blood supply is uh, returned, then the tissue would then become red. So it goes from white to blue to red. The last group of vasculitides is going to be the small vessel vasculitis. And this is going to involve small vessels, such as arterioles, capillaries, and venules. Now, the first disorder that we want to talk about is called Wegener granulomatosis. And this is a necrotizing granulomatous vasculitis that involves the nasopharynx, lungs, and kidneys. Once you understand the distribution, you're pretty much done with this disease. So I'll tell you how I remember this. Instead of calling it Wegener's granulomatosis, I have this funny thing where I call it Wegener's granulomatosis with a C. And that helps me to remember that there are a lot of C's associated with this disease. For example, number one, if this is the patient, very simplistically obviously, the distribution of disease is basically like this. So it kind of looks like a C. It involves the nasopharynx, it involves the lungs, 
and it involves the kidney. Again, the nasopharynx, the lungs, and the kidney. And so uh, I remember the distribution by remembering this as the C disease. All right, so that's the first thing, and that is that it involves the nasopharynx, the lung, and the kidneys. Another important thing that I'm reminded of by the letter C is that the patients have a C anca, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody, and we'll touch on that more in a minute. Uh, and the final is that the key treatment in this disorder is cyclophosphamide, which also starts with a C. This classically presents in a middle-aged male with sinusitis or nasopharyngeal ulceration. Again, they normally have involvement of the nasopharynx. They also get involvement of the lung, so they'll have hemoptysis with bilateral nodular lung infiltrates. And then they get involvement of the kidney, and the classic involvement of the kidney is going to be something called rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And so the patients will actually present with hematuria. And we'll talk about rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis in much more detail when we do your uh, kidney or renal section. Again, I've already told you that these patients classically have an elevated serum C. anca, and the level of C. anca actually correlates with disease activity. Let's just remind ourselves about the anca. Uh, this is an example of how we do the anca test. Here's a slide. On the slide, you've got a test neutrophil, and this is the nucleus of that neutrophil. You take the patient's serum, and you introduce it to the test slide. Now, if the patient in their serum has antibodies against the neutrophil, then you'll see anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. Those anti-neutrophil antibodies can be present adjacent to the nucleus, which is called a P anca or perinuclear anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody, or the antibodies can react with something that is in the periphery of the cytoplasm. And these are called the C anca or cytoplasmic anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. And so these are the two possibilities, and of course C. anca is related to Wegener's granulomatosis. Now when biopsy is performed, the key finding will be large necrotizing granulomas with adjacent necrotizing vasculitis. This is what it looks like. You get this large area of necrosis, and that's what creates those nodular lung infiltrates that we talked about earlier. And then when you look at the wall, you're going to see uh, giant cells and characteristic features of granuloma. And so this is what we characteristically see. We have epithelioid histiocytes with some giant cells. And so again, this is Wegener's granulomatosis. The key treatment is cyclophosphamide. That's high yield. And relapses in this disorder are fairly common. Now another small vessel vasculitis is called microscopic polyangiitis. This is a necrotizing vasculitis that involves multiple organs, hence the name polyangiitis poly implying multiple uh, blood vessels, and it especially involves the lung and the kidney. Basically, it's very similar to Wegener granulomatosis. However, you're going to be missing a few things. In Wegener granulomatosis, you would expect to see nasopharyngeal involvement. In this disease, you will not see that. In Wegener granulomatosis, you would expect to see granulomas. In this disease, you will not see that. Finally, in Wegener's granulomatosis, you would see a C. anca. However, in this disease, you are going to see a P. anca. So those are some important distinctions. So although it involves a lung and the kidney, and so therefore can look somewhat similar to Wegener's granulomatosis clinically, it's going to be very distinct because it will not have nasopharyngeal involvement. On biopsy, it will not have granulomas. And instead of a C. anca, it will have a P. anca. Treatment for this disorder is very similar to Wegener's granulomatosis. Uh, cyclophosphamide and corticosteroids and relapses, again, are common. Another small vessel vasculitis is called Churg-Strauss syndrome. This is where you get necrotizing granulomatous vasculitis with eosinophils. Again, it can involve multiple organs, especially the lungs and the heart. And what you really want to do is you want to, dis you want to distinguish this from microscopic polyangiitis. Now, why would you want to do that? Because in this particular disorder, when you study the ANCA, you're going to get a P. ANCA. So basically, there are two disorders that are going to give you a P. ANCA. The first is microscopic polyangiitis. And the second is Churg-Strauss. And so we need to be able to distinguish between those two disorders. Well, there's a couple things that are going to help you to distinguish those two disorders. Number one, in Churg-Strauss, you have granulomas. And recall that in microscopic polyangiitis, there were no granulomas. Number two, in Churg-Strauss, the patients often have asthma. In microscopic polyangiitis, there will be no history of asthma. And number three, the patients often have peripheral eosinophilia. In microscopic polyangiitis, there would be no peripheral eosinophilia. So there are three features that help you to distinguish Churg-Strauss syndrome 
from microscopic polyangiitis. And of course, we've got to make that distinction because both of them are p anca positive. The last small vessel vasculitis that I want to talk about is called HSP or Hanak-Sherline purpura. This is a vasculitis due to IgA immune complex deposition. It's the most common vasculitis in kids. The classic presentation is that of palpable purpura on the buttocks and the legs. The purpura indicates that it looks very similar to bleeding in the skin. However, remember that when you have bleeding in the skin, it would not be palpable. In this particular case, it is palpable, and that's because, it's, because there's inflammation along with that vasculitis. So the patients get palpable purpura, and that word palpable is very important on the buttocks and the legs. They can also get involvement of the abdominal tract, resulting in GI pain and bleeding. They can get involvement of the kidney, which results in hematuria. The involvement of the kidney is very high yield. It's, uh, it basically is due to something called IgA nephropathy, which is a disorder in which you get deposition of IgA within the mesangium, which then results in uh, glomerular bleeding. And so this is a very high yield association, and that is that in HSP, the patients basically develop IgA nephropathy. Now, the interesting thing about this disorder is that it usually occurs following an upper respiratory tract infection. And what's the idea here? Well, when you get an upper respiratory tract infection, one of the antibodies that you're going to generate is going to be IgA because IgA helps to protect mucosal sites. When you generate high levels of IgA, patients with this disorder will then have this IgA deposit, and it's the deposition of IgA that drives the vasculitis. Remember that I defined HSP as a vasculitis due to IgA immune complex deposition. So it should not be difficult to remember that when patients get an upper respiratory tract infection, that's when they're going to present with this vasculitis because, again, the, the, you're getting excessive production of IgA. The disease is self-limited, but it can recur, and if it's very severe, uh, the, you might consider treating it with steroids. But generally speaking, it's self-limited and will resolve by itself. So that concludes the discussion on vasculitis, and we're now going to move to hypertension in the next section.